just joining in, so maybe we can get going. Okay, so my name is Chris Stepanuk. I'm the Extension Program Leader uh, with Lake Champlain Sea Grant, and my colleague Ashley Eaton is the Lake and Watershed Education Coordinator for Lake Champlain Sea Grant, and we both work with UVM Extension in the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources at the University of Vermont. And the webinar that you've joined today is part of a stormwater education series that pairs with a course that we're leading uh, that links with a middle and high school and upper elementary school curriculum around stormwater and stormwater stewardship. And the idea behind the series of speakers that we have all throughout this semester is to hear different perspectives of, of professionals who are engaged in stormwater, green stormwater infrastructure, and solving water quality problems through the use of green stormwater infrastructure, as well as thinking about maintenance and workforce uh, education opportunities. And so today we are super lucky to have with us Sarah Hoffmeyer, who is uh, with the landscapes rooted in design, the equilibrium. And she has worked in the landscape field for over a decade since 2007. And she's a graduate of the Conway School of Landscape Design and also George Washington University in Washington, DC. And Sarah is the proud, well, the way that I know Sarah is, is a, a designer of a particular rain garden in the city of Montpelier. And so she's gonna share with us today the process that she goes through when planning rain gardens and, and the art and science of designing these green stormwater infrastructure systems. So Sarah, I'll turn it over to you. And uh, so folks know, what we will plan to have her do is she speaks for 35, 40 minutes, something like that. And then we will have a question and answer session. You can use in the bottom of the uh, screen, your Zoom screen. At any point, if you have a problem, let us know in the chat or through the Q&A at the bottom. And if when we do get to the question and answer session, we can allow you to voice your questions uh, so you can literally ask them, or you can also use the question and answer to type a question uh, when that comes. So, oh, Sarah, thanks for being with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is great. Um, and I tend to get very excited about what I'm doing. And so give me like a two minute warning if I'm like starting to go over. Okay. <laughs> I also go off on tangents. So <laughs> okay. I try to stick to the subject. Okay. Um, Yes, uh, I'll start just by giving a quick, um, that was a great introduction, Chris, but I'll give a little bit more in my background, just so you all know kind of where I'm coming from. Um, I actually did not start in the green field at all. I was a business major um, in college and after graduating, I traveled a little bit and then um, ended up in DC and I was working for a nonprofit doing marketing and administrative work. Um, and it was called the Sulfur Institute. So um, they specialized in the element sulfur. And I worked for, um, basically our clients were petroleum companies. So like Shell and Exxon Mobil. Um, and what's interesting is a byproduct of petroleum processing is sulfur. So in my little, um, in my little office, there were like 10 people, but I worked with engineers and then with agricultural scientists which was really, really interesting. Um, it was a really exhausting job. Um, it was corporate. Uh, I was flown all over the place, all around the world, um, but I really did not like the culture. So I gave up what was a decent job for a 20 something year old and uh, started working for a native plant nursery for $10 an hour <laughs> and I could not have been happier. <laughs> it's called Nature by Design in Alexandria, Virginia if you're ever down that way. Um, and that was kind of where I started. So at that point I was 24, 25. Um, and I started taking classes at the George Washington University. And that was a much more, um, what I would call conventional program. Um, and it was great. I learned a ton, but I really wanted to get to go further with it. So then I ended up going to the, the Conway School of Landscape Design. So my background and what's great about Conway in particular and I think it's now much more common, but um, there's a real, it's kind of a, an earthy hippie school that I love, um, but there's a real ecological lens to it. So um, the way that I was, I was trained was really um, to take, um, the, one of the biggest aspects of it was how do you connect people 
with the outdoors. And so client preferences and educating the client, super important. Um, so that's, that's kind of my background. Uh, and I've lived in Montpelier since 2009 um, and worked in and around central Vermont. Okay, so for the, to, just to get everybody on the same page, because I don't know what everyone's level is of experience, I think it's really good to all be working off of the same definitions. So this definition is paraphrased from the Environmental Protection Agency. And I think it's a pretty good simplified definition of a rain garden. Um, a depressed area in the landscape that collects stormwater. Um, and this is coming from impervious surfaces. So asphalt, driveways, rooftops, things where it's not absorbing into the ground. Um, typically rain gardens are planted with perennials, shrubs and trees. Um, and we'll get further into like the benefits of the plants. And so there's so many benefits outside of just the actual rain garden function, but um, providing wildlife habitat and opportunities for contaminant removal. Um, that's kind of an icing on the cake, which there will be a little bit more to talk about there. Um, and then, so I see with my own clients, and I should step back for one minute. So I do small scale landscape design. So for the most part, my clients have under an acre, I would say, most people that I work with. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty uh, detailed, de detailed design work that I do. Um, when it comes to rain gardens, I get a lot of people that are excited about rain gardens and they wanna put them on their property. Nine times out of 10, they'll say, in the spring, I get a pool of water here, let's put in a rain garden. And that's actually the opposite of what you wanna do. You, it's really good to work with what soils you have and you need well-drained soils for rain gardens. Um, the whole point is to infiltrate, slow it down. You would want a different system if you have a pond. <laughs> you want things to keep moving. Rain gardens, typically, I like to see them drain within 48 hours. Um, and that's just for the health of the plants. That's for the health of the system itself. Um, so you're not getting other gunky stuff in it. Um, the difference between a rain garden and a bioretention area to me is that, um, and this is from the EPA website again, that they're just more complex. They have drainage systems. I typically say they're bigger. They tend to take on a greater volume of stormwater. Um, and then you can see plan view is bird's eye view. So looking down on it and then a cross section. So hopefully that kind of all makes sense. I should say with this project in particular, um, what I was really excited about were all the different partnerships. Um, I don't know if any of you know Paige Gurdon. She's on the Montpelier Conservation Commission. She spearheaded the whole thing. She's the one that found the funding for it. She decided this was a project that needed to happen. Um, just put her heart and soul into it and made it happen. Uh, VSCCU, which is the Vermont State Employee Credit Union, which is in Montpelier, could not have been more accommodating. Um, Simeon, who works there, is just fantastic. And so not only were they on board, but to give us the space, to give us the um, things like marketing resources, uh, we were allowed to like tap into certain things that they had. So it was, we couldn't have done it without them. Um, Mark Companion, uh, many of you probably know at Lake Champlain Basin Program, just a fantastic resource for me. Thank you, Mark. Um, and then Vermont Youth Conservation Corps, those were the people that put in the hard labor. Um, wow, they moved a lot of soil. <laughs> They're, Thank you, BYCC. Um, Sustainable Montpelier Coalition is Elizabeth Courtney, who is a landscape architect that I partner with often. Um, she is just a fabulous person and she served as a mentor to me in many cases. Um, we had funding then also from NUCPIC. And then um, even though she's not on our partner list, I could not have done this without Amy McCrellis. So Stone Environmental, if you ever come across her, her brain is phenomenal. Um, so, to get a little bit familiar with the site, this is in Montpelier, like I said, this is right off of the highway. So, whenever you take exit 8 to get into Montpelier, at the very bottom of the screen you see Route 2, um, this is right off of it, it's the first stop. Something anecdotally that I was told um, when we first started working on this project was that <laughs> people that have problems with their cars on the highway will 
pull off into exit eight. And this is the first parking lot that they stop at because it's, it's the most welcoming. It's not the first pull off, but uh, the VY, the VSCCU folks said that they um, see more, more tow trucks <laughs> than like anything else, um, which we'll come back later to, but usually when cars are having problems, they might be dripping things. And so again, we'll get into like the contaminants that are coming from this, this site. But our, the site itself you can see is in pink. That's the green space that we were working with. That's not necessarily what we developed, but the blue arrow is where the water is coming from. And that was 9,000 square feet of impervious surface. So um, 9,000 square feet is a lot. <laughs> so our problem was stormwater management. So these are pictures that are um, looking at, there's a, a pull through that you can see there. It's that direction that all the water is coming from. In a one inch storm event, 5,100 gallons of water and I didn't almost believe this at first. It sounds crazy <laughs> that it's that much water, but it's true. It really, when we, did, when we first made the rain garden, there was an issue with drainage, which we'll talk about later, but um, it was amazing with how quickly it filled up. And it, so it takes on this huge amount of, of water. And from the calculations, which Amy helped with, Amy McCrellis, um, we needed at a minimum 420 square feet of rain garden. And that's um, two feet deep, uh, 420 square feet, um, linear square feet. So our challenge was, you see all this water that came directly into the storm drain. Um, there was nothing stopping it, uh, just that little bit of, of grass filter. But even then you've got preferential pathways that just channeled right to the storm drain. So the very first thing we did with construction was to put in, and you can see this in the bottom left-hand corner, um, some granite curbing just to direct water to where the cones are. And that, that in and of itself, that redirection of water just gives it time to drop sediment, drop um, part particles. So in and of itself, each little step that we did is helping along the way. So big goals of the rain garden. This is the site on a beautiful summer day um, and it's lawn, it's just lawn. Uh, and you can see the storm drain is located off to the left. You can see that little depression kind of where the shade of the oak tree is. So our big goals were slow the water, infiltrate, filter, remove and degrade contaminants. Degrading contaminants is kind of icing on the cake and I'll get more into that later, that it's, it's something that, um, you know, it's, it's something that I hope is happening, but it's a really hard thing to assess and to monitor. So my hope is that it's happening. We'll talk about it later though. <laughs> uh, we definitely are providing habitat, um, some wildlife value. It's, I hope, interesting to humans. I think going from lawn to almost anything is more interesting, but <laughs> I'm very biased. <laughs> and then the biggest thing is all those different partnerships, all those different outlets that we had, and it's high, highly, highly visible. It's a great tool just of outreach of, oh man, we need to take better care of our river. Guess what? This little thing is a small step to help take care of the river and just have more eyes going towards the river and thinking about what's coming off of my driveway. Like maybe I should redirect my water. So, and I think it's, I hope it's doing that. So this is the part that I, um, I do the most with all of my clients. During the season, I do this once or twice a week where I meet with somebody, we talk about their site, we talk about all these different factors. Um, I am a plant nerd. I love plants. They're so much fun. But in any landscape design, plants are the very last step unless it is like a 400 year old historic tree that you're trying to design around, plants truly come last. Um, all of these things help decide what is the best plant to put here? What are the sizes of the plants? And then just knowing that all landscapes are gonna change over time. And like 
lighten up, like don't have a, <laughs> you don't want the, everything to be just like stationary. You want things to change. You want things to blend and, and move. I mean, that's, that's what nature is. Nature is not stagnant. It, it moves. Um, so going back, psych, site analysis. So the first thing, these are the most, I apologize to zoning. I love you guys, but of my job, it is the most boring part <laughs> to go through regulations. <laughs> So the biggest thing is this is in a floodplain. So we had to make sure that we didn't need any um, special permits and, and just and to make sure that we were allowed to do this just in general, any kind of earth moving near rivers is usually a pretty prickly subject. You gotta make sure that you're doing everything correctly um, and you have to take the right um, steps in order to do an installation properly. So you're not causing more damage. Um, so yes, it's in the floodplain. We were checking property lines, just kind of double checking, making sure this is all legal. I always check utilities. You can see utility lines running above the site. So that just, that to me signals, do not plant tall trees here because we don't know when those utility lines are going to change, but we don't want pruning. I, I don't like to prune things. I'm not a big, um, bonsai person. <laughs> anything. I'm like, let it be, let it just be the way it's supposed to be. So I wouldn't be planting a majestic burr oak in the middle of this site, knowing that there are power lines right above it. Um, soil samples. We just wanted to make sure that this wasn't, I did take some soil samples and that was to make sure, first of all, that um, nothing funky is going on. Like it doesn't have a pH of four or a pH of over eight. Like that would be weird. Um, and then also to double check and make sure this, um, this wasn't a brownfield site or there was some, something else that was happening here historically that might affect the soils. Because that's a big thing. You don't want to start construction and be suddenly mobilizing different soils that might be potentially dangerous or worse for the river than what you're even trying to help. Um, looked at the site. This was easy breezy. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty flat site. So it got full sun, which is great. That always opens up the options for plants. Um, and it's good for evaporation. It's good for a lot of things. Um, we looked at access and circulation. So this is a highly trafficked area, not through the site, but around the site. So there's bikes that are on the bike path that you can see at the um, cutting across the picture, uh, a sidewalk and a road, and then you have the pull through. Um, so yeah, it's got, a, it's got a lot of eyes on it. Uh, drainage and snow loads are a big one. This one doesn't have roof lines to deal with at all, but it does have the snow plow used to put the snow where the white rectangle is. So we had to say to the, to the people that were plowing, you, you definitely need to find a new home for your snow loads. Um, just because after this system is developed, we wanna keep it functioning really well. And things like excess salt and sand excuse me, and any other kind of debris that a snow plow is dumping there can clog the system. And just make it, it, it can just make it so that it's not as healthy in the long term. Um, views, this one was easy. It had views from all over, <laughs> 360. And then client preferences. And this one to me is the most important. Um, it's, it would be really easy for, for me to come in and just plop my thoughts, my design onto it. But then I'm the only person that's invested into, the, into this project. When you start getting other people's ideas, it might be more management in the beginning and a lot more time. But in the long run, you have all these people that care more about it. So, I, and I love, I love working with people cool people. <laughs> I don't like working with jerks. <laughs> but I love working with um, different stakeholders just so when you can get them excited about it, th all those partners that I mentioned earlier, we're already working on different projects. We're trying to figure out how do we, how do we replicate this? This was kind of, as a team, this was like our pilot project. And now we're like, okay, it worked. Let's do it again. And let's do it even better. Um, so now other people, and all the people that would all the volunteers that came to help us and all the people on the bike path that asked questions as we were doing it, it's, it just kind of spread the good juju. Like it's, it's a really, it was a really good thing. Um, so that's the design process. 
this was kind of our first conceptual design. This is still early stages, but it's ultimately what ended up happening. I should say this was a very quick project. Um, it came up quickly, it needed to be designed quickly, and it needed to be implemented quickly. Um, that's not usually the way that I work, <laughs> but when, again, when you're balancing out the benefits over the drawbacks of waiting, um, the grant money was there and it was like, get it in, it's, it, and it is going to be much better than not doing anything. So you can see this is Elizabeth Courtney's beautiful, and she calls it a sketch, I think it's gorgeous. Um, drawing and then you can see a very quick this is more of a, a design um, a construction document but um, just the plant schedule is in the bottom right hand corner where I list off species some of those species are no longer there we'll talk about that in a second <laughs> um, over here so you're seeing some of the plants that make up the rain garden today Whenever I'm choosing plants, this is after I've done all of that site analysis, um, and it's really, my plant palettes are, okay, these are the plants that are gonna survive. And then comes kind of the fun, artsy part of it, is you know making sure that you have bloom times at, all throughout the season, making sure that you're providing certain habitats for species that you know are in and around Montpelier. Um, different heights, making sure that you know you're not blocking certain blooms at certain times. I always like to have winter interest, so things that usually the grasses are sturdy enough that they can stay for the winter and then they can also be habitat for overwintering insects. Um, so in this case root systems too were, were an important consideration. Um, so looking at things like Baptisia, which is uh, false indigo, that has a taproot. Um, it's also a great nitrogen fixing plant, so which means that it's taking atmospheric nitrogen, it's got these fabulous little microorganisms, microbes, bacteria um, that are around its root systems that are helping that plant um, take the nitrogen and actually put it back into the soil. Most plants take it up. So it's a, kind of, it's a nice one. All, anything in the legume family does that. So it's nice to incorporate those in. It's like a it's like a little natural fertilizer. Um, the grasses have really good fibrous deep root systems. So those are another one that in addition to just the whole, and we'll get into the construction of it, but they're breaking up all that soil medium and really allowing water to infiltrate. Um, I always pop in plants like uh, Lobelia cardinalis, which is cardinal flower. It is a short lived plant but oh, it is bang for your buck. It is like fireworks. It looks gorgeous right away um, and it self seeds. So you get lots of babies, which are great because they're gonna fill in all these little areas that need a little bit longer to, for the um, plants that take longer to establish to fill in. Um, and then let's see, and then we'll talk about phytoremediation, just a second. So these plants, some of them were chosen for their ability to break down contaminants. But I have to say, right off the get-go, <laughs> I don't know if they're doing it. <laughs> I, have no, I have no scientific evidence to show that they are. My hope is that they are. Um, this is a very, and this will be one of the only like scientific nerdy slides that we get into. This was adapted from Kate McKinnon and Neil Kirkwood have a fabulous book that I reference all the time called Phyto all about phytoremediation. Um, the challenging part with phytoremediation is that conditions need to be just right <laughs> for a plant to, to, for a plant to degrade toxins, contaminants. So if a pH is too high, it might not, the microbes that are doing it, their metabolism might not be working as, as quickly. Um, if the temperature is off, if the concentration of the contamin contaminant is too high or too low, there's so many factors. It's really complicated. Um, and truthfully, I, I, I don't go that far, that deep into it um, to know whether or not these plants are doing it in the system that we designed or even what time, times of year they're doing it maybe. I don't know. Um, but the hope is that they are. So what I focused on without knowing exactly what contaminants we had, 
I felt like I, I could make an educated assumption that we definitely have PAHs. And PAHs are um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, just a fancy way of saying a contaminant that comes from petroleum. <laughs> and these are things that are found in asphalt, in um, fuels, oil, greases. And so I'm pretty confident going back to that cars breaking down and leaking things, I'm guessing that they're leaking some oils sometimes. When tires are breaking down, when asphalt is degrading, there, are, there is a release of the PAHs. So assuming that, that's where it was, first of all, we need to pick plants that are tolerant of that toxin because we know it's coming off of the first flush of a rainstorm. Those contaminants are gonna be coming into the rain garden. And then beyond that, picking plants that there are scientific studies out there, um, specifically the ones that I used, um, goldenrod, solidago, um, switchgrass, the panicum, the, those ones are known for being um, phytoremediators of um, PAHs. Um, the juncus was another one. Um, and I wanna say iris was another one. So I, I put in kind of a scattering hoping that they're doing their work. So we'll see. Um, but there are three different ways for the for petroleum contaminants to be phytoremediated. And this is, again, it's getting a little sciencey, but um, I'm going to hit you with it and then we'll move on. There's rhizodegradation, which is in the root systems. This is around the root systems. This is where the microbes and bacteria are metabolizing and breaking apart those contaminants. So something that comes in that's a toxin, they're either making less toxic or sometimes non-toxic, which is great. Um, and then there's um, the phytodegradation, which is when they take the toxin, it's um, the compound is connected with other things and it's going up into the plant and the cells of the plant are metabolizing and breaking apart that contaminant. And then phytovolatization is so cool, but um, I know there are some mixed feelings probably about it. It's taking a contaminant from the soil and basically making it into a gas. Um, but I still think that it's so important. I mean, it's that concentration is broken up now. Um, and it's that concentration that can do the main damage, in my opinion. Okay, so if you want to know more about that, I can put you in touch with people that know far more about the the real chemistry of it. Chemistry was never my strong subject in school, <laughs> but it's fascinating stuff. Um, so onto the installation. This is where VYCC, mad props to you guys, they dug out about 30 yards of material by hand. Um, amazing. They were, they were such um, a joyful group of people <laughs> for such a hot, hot summer job. Um, the big thing was, and we'll see it in the next slide, is making sure that the sides were sloped two to one. It's, it's all about even distribution of the, the drainage, the water that's coming in, so that channels aren't being made. So it's really important to make sure everything is nice and even, the bottom is level, and then we added back in a soil medium. And that was one, um, it had mainly sand in it, but it was also a mix of um, topsoil, a little bit of compost to get the plant started, and then also um, wood chips, some fine wood chips. And as the wood chips um, are, degra are um, degrading, they're providing a little bit of habitat for things like fungi and get that mycelium going. And it's all about getting a really good soil ecosystem because that's where like all, it's, it's all the stuff that you don't see that truly can be doing a lot of really good work. Okay, so we had instant habitat. It was like, woohoo, that's my son. He's got a little caterpillar on him. And that was, the plants weren't even in the ground yet, but it was so exciting. There were butterflies and moths and caterpillars. And I would see little footprints of things going across the basin of the rain garden before the plants even went in. So it was really, really exciting. And it looked, I think it looked really like, bang for your back, like lots of color and just plant life right away. And it was really clean looking but something wasn't right. <laughs> this is the disappointing part. And this was my mistake. It was fully my mistake. We did a infiltration test before this went in and um, I was psyched. I dug down maybe 
20 inches and did a soil test and it was like five inches an hour, six inches an hour. It was crazy. It was like so quickly drained. And I'm like, this is fantastic. Um, come to find out when we hit the 24 inch mark, it was clay. So that's <laughs> not a good thing. <laughs> it was advertised as a rain garden project. So another assumption I made, which was totally my mistake, was this does not need an underdrain. This isn't a bioretention area. This is a rain garden. Easy breezy. Well, it did need an underdrain. And then we, we kind of did a little experiment. And I, I remember Mark and Amy were kind of like, go ahead, Sarah, try it. <laughs> It was all my fault. <laughs> but um, there, because there was such good horizontal infiltration, so as it fills up, it's, it's going to be going through the sides. And so the thought was maybe we have enough horizontal infiltration that it won't be that huge of, of a difference. But it was. It was a huge difference. Um, it ponded and it didn't drain. Oh, gosh, I think it was a six. It took six days to fully drain, which is not OK at all. Um, so we went back in. And in this slide, you can see put in a, an under drain, so a perforated pipe. And I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the, so it's the teal colored um, under drain here. The four bay also wasn't draining super well either. Um, and that again, we should have, it did have a clay bottom, but we ended up putting in what I call a little stone burrito up at the top here. And that's basically so, and it's, on, it's, it's at the very bottom of it so that um, it just allows the rain garden to fill on that one side if it's not draining quickly enough. Um, and then it does infiltrate. So it's not, it's not ideal. If I had to redesign this, again, knowing everything that I know, I would do it a little bit differently. But <laughs> given everything that we went through, um, the amount of work that this practice is doing is fantastic. Um, and I'll show you. So, so I had to wait all winter, which I was on pins and needles. I don't know if you guys feel that way whenever you're like, is this going to work? Did I do it right? <laughs> I was so nervous. And then this is this year in the spring and things are working beautifully. Um, if you can see, this is, a, this is a dry, the rain garden is dry in this picture, but there's still a ton of gunk in the four bay, a ton I mean, think of all that that we're capturing just from sedimentation, just from it slowing down, dropping out those particles and pollutants, and then it moves into the system where things are now starting to spread. The plants are living, finally. <laughs> Many things didn't survive the two week flood, two plus week flood. Um, I did leave it messy this year and that was on purpose. As that, because that basin had many of the plants die out from my mistake, I actually left grass in what I'm calling like the rumble strips or the filter strips, um, just to have a little extra filtration that I felt like if I could leave a little bit more green, it would help with if there was any kind of overflow. So now things are functioning really, really well. I'm, I'm really excited. I think it's gonna fill in beautifully. I put in a few more species that sell seeds, so things like Verbena hestata, which is blue vervain. That one's one. It's going to shoot out a bunch of seeds. The Lobelia cardinalis is going to do that. The grasses are going to spread. I really think it's going to fill in and mesh really well. The stones are there too as stepping stones. Um, with any kind of rain garden, you really don't want to compact the soils a lot. Um, it'll compact a bit over time just from like the water, but the less you step on it and squish it down, the better. So finally, maintenance. Um, we did need to water to get the plants established. And it's so ironic. It's like you're watering a rain garden, but you have to, you've got to get the plants going. That's the whole thing. Once the plants are going, then you step back. It's so little work. Um, I love this picture. I use it all the time. Goldenrod is such an amazing plant. Um, I think we have something like 43 species of Solidago that are native indigenous to Vermont. Um, and there's only a few that are, well, there are a few thugs within the Solidago family, no doubt about it, but there's also a few that are really well behaved. So um, I try to convince certain people, certain clients that I feel like are a little more open to some wild looking, more natural looking plants. I'm like, try out some goldenrods. Like there are some really cool ones. It's also my favorite type of, um, whenever we get honey, 
the goldenrod uh, pollinated honey is one of my favorites. You can taste, taste the difference. Um, but yeah, look at this, they're growing out of asphalt. So it just goes to show you that no matter what you're putting in, even if it's total pavement, um, you're gonna have a little bit of maintenance. We did um, think about beaver and deer as well. Those are two big pests. <laughs> they're cute, but they're pests for gardens um, in this specific practice. Beavers, um, there are two beautiful oak trees that are right next to the rain garden. There's also birch and little leaf linden. I don't, and the beavers could easily take down any of them, so they're all protected with a little bit of, um, of wiring. And then deer, I didn't put in anything that was really um, the deer go nuts over. Um, so anyway, just because there's tons of deer in Montpelier. So um, I'll stop there and take any questions. And thank you all for listening to me just blabber for a while. <laughs> Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, so I would like to invite everyone now, all of the folks that are joining us, if you have questions for Sarah, if you want to raise your hand or put a question in the Q&A or just put your name in the chat, um, Chris and I can give you permission to ask your question aloud um, here to the group or if there's a question that you wanna just throw in the chat box, Chris and I are happy to moderate that um, and pose that question to Sarah. And if anyone's um, too shy to ask right now, I'm, I'm always happy to answer emails. Please use my email. Um, and I, I love talking on the phone too. I'm going into my off season, so I have a little bit more time and we'll respond a little more quickly, but I'm happy to, to do that. Great. Um, all right, so we have our first question coming in. This is a good question, something I was thinking about um, too. Can you talk about the costs, both expected and unexpected related to this project? Oh, yeah. So we were working on um, a really, really tight budget. The budget was roughly uh, 14,500, I wanna say, which any time um, you're talking about earth moving, that's a really big expense. Like trucking is a, is a really big expense. Um, the under drain was actually the biggest uh, unexpected um, expense because in order to put in the under drain, we needed to tie it directly into the storm drain, which is a huge underground concrete thing. <laughs> and so um, in order to just get someone to come out for a few hours and drill into it, it was like $900, which that, that ate up a good bit of our, um, yeah, that was at the after, after the whole project had gone in and we're like, oh, an extra $900, okay. Um, Plants, when, typically whenever I design a landscape, my landscape design fee is roughly, when you break down like the majority of my projects, it's roughly 10%. Plant cost, material cost, roughly 50%. And then you have a bunch of other things like mulch and compost. Well, no, that, that would actually, no, plants are 50% and then you have all the other incidentals that go with it. Um, trucking debris disposal, things like that. Um, but yeah, so this project, VYCC was um, a cost, that was our labor. And then plants were roughly, gosh, I wanna say they were like maybe 25% of the cost, but the biggest cost was the soil medium that we brought in and then trucking, getting stuff out and machine fees. Those are always the biggest. Do you, want, do you want any more detail on that one? Or did that? <laughs> I think that was great. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a one, uh, there's a couple of questions in the chat. One of them is how often do you consider thermal effects of the water on the plants? Yes, that is, that is such a good question. So, right, that is one of the uh, most exciting things about this project is, of course, impervious surface asphalt, you just think of a hot summer day and then a rainstorm that comes right after it, the temperature of that water going into the storm drain and then into a river system, no, no species likes that. <laughs> it's just not natural. Um, or I can't think of many that do. But uh, yes, so um, temperature is big. That it, uh, one of the reasons why we have that four bay 
is to, again, it's all about slowing the water. So if you can really slow that water down, get it into the forebay, and then the goal is that it's actually infiltrating through some soil, which would cool it before it gets to the main basin. We've been, um, I also call it the bowl of blooms. That was like the common thing that everybody called it that I was working with. So yeah, ideally you want it to get to the bowl of blooms at a much lower temperature than it's entering the system into that forebay. Um, yeah, that's an interesting, a really interesting, um, I have not looked into it and now you made me really want to about which species can take what temperatures. Um, yeah, that's a, it's a really good point. Yeah, I'll have to look into it more. Get in touch with me. <laughs> I might have some scientific studies in a couple of weeks <laughs> that I've found. <laughs> That's great. And actually, this is sparking a lot of interest about that, the forebay and the function of that. So um, William is asking, could you explain the concept and function of the forebay, either the way it was originally planned or as it ended up being used um, in the project? Yeah, um, this was the first forebay that I had ever put in. The rain gardens that I had designed before this um, I don't think they took on the amount of water, they did not take on the amount of water or what I assumed the amount of contaminants. So we put in the four bay and it was decided early on actually in the design process, knowing that um, it, we needed a place for things to settle out. So sedimentation is a really good thing with any kind of wastewater system, anything that's treating wastewater you want to have kind of a, it's like the first filtration where you get cigarette butts and you get debris and other types of just big pollutants that um, if you can stop that from getting into the system, it's not going to clog it, it's not going to take up that space. And, and that four bay is actually really easy to clean out. Um, we just, what we recommend is that it just gets shop vacked on a really dry day when it's all the gunk, you would, you would be amazed. I highly recommend anyone to come down in the spring at, after the snow has melted to see just the layer. It's, it's like an inch thick of just gunk. And it's, it's so exciting because it's like, that's not going into the river and that's not even going into the flower basin. It's like, it's staying right there. Suck it up and get it out of there. Yeah, dispose of it properly. Uh, so I think that kind of is getting at these other two questions that are in the question and answer, which it says, um, Brianna asks, does the four bay get emptied of sediment? If so, by who? And where does the sediment go? So maybe answer that first and then we can move to the next one. So it sounds like uh, building on what the shop vac. Yes. And, and I've done it by hand too, because again, I hadn't put in a four bay. So I'm kind of experimenting with the most efficient ways to clean it. Um, the sad part is and I'm working on it. And if anyone has suggestions, hit me up with some suggestions. Um, I've been taking it to, so I, I literally bag it and take it off site. And how I, where I put it is where the street sweepers put what they clean from our streets and it's in at the stump dump. And we've had long discussions about this. Um, it's only been cleaned a few times. And so we're still kind of figuring it out. And that was the solution at the moment. But I do wonder about, and I'd love to do testing to see what kind of contaminants are in that. I'm sure it's, it's horrible. And where would be the proper place to put it? You know, is a landfill better in that case or where all, all the street sweepers dump their material? Um, again, it's in a place that's far from, um, it has it has more of a chance to um, be dispersed and buried, and so it's and it's all concentrated in that one spot. Whereas this is going right into the Winooski, so I feel like it's better to do what we're doing at the moment. But we are still trying to figure it out. That's something that, um, yeah, it's still a question. So yes, I do. I take I have taken it out, and the maintenance crew will take over for me um, next spring. And at this second, it will go where the street sweepers go. But ideally it would go in a better place. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And Stephanie Hurley was commenting on that question as well, saying this is one of the challenges of her projects in figuring out who scoops out the four bay, where it goes, um, especially as you said, it could be full of heavy metals or PHAs or other, you know, potential contaminants and how do you manage those? Yeah. Um, so that's great. Hi, Stephanie. We need to figure out a place. We need to start a, <laughs> a hazardous waste place for four bays. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, Lake Champlain Secret will be coming out with a re request for proposals soon. This could be a really interesting project <laughs> to quantify that and then to make recommendations around what should happen with um, rain garden because um, maintenance is a big issue that Mark Companion can speak to and um, of, of across the state right at the moment is looking at what are the operations and maintenance procedures for green infrastructure. So, yeah, cool. yeah. And yeah, the same stuff. I mean, the street sweepers are getting it too. It's all that stuff that's built up on the sides of the streets. Mm -hmm. It's not that far off from what's coming into that four bay and it's, mm -hmm. well, yep. yeah, we'll figure it out. We're going to figure it out. <laughs> Makes sense. Do other folks have questions? Uh, Maybe not, maybe so. <laughs> Doesn't have to be about the rain garden either. You can ask me about other things. <laughs> have you, have, have you worked on, you do this otherwise. Have you worked on others in similar ways where you had to go back and kind of re jigger things to get them working better? Or is it a unique to this particular project? Uh, this one was a pretty dramatic mistake needed correction. Other ones, there will be adjustments, and this happens actually beyond rain gardens, but um, there will be certain pests that come in that a certain species of plant will be gone in a season. The deer come through, like a will have planted willows and dogwoods, and suddenly the deer come through and they're all gone, and it's like, well, I need to replant that with something else. Um, so those kind of adjustments, I feel like I do the most frequently. Um, but with this one, yeah, this one was a, oh, a direct <laughs> cause and effect <laughs> where it was, it was corrected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Ashley, you want to field the next one? Or you just did? Sure thing. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So another question coming in. Um, did any of the VYCC folks have a particular interest in the plant species? Do you think that they... Um, that you may have inspired a future landscape designer? <laughs> oh man, after digging out 30 yards of soil, I don't think any of them wanted to ever do a rain garden again. <laughs> but I had, um, oh gosh, we had so much fun too though. It was such a good just group of people and they had such, I mean, again, this is why I love partnering with people. They have, they had such a diverse background. Some people were far, you know, had grown up farming. Some people had um, incredible carpentry skills and just like hearing about their backgrounds. Um, it was, it was really fascinating and they were all really hard workers. We talked a little bit about landscape uh, design, a little bit about plants. There were a few gardeners that they all wanted to, they were, um, really wanting to know what they could eat. That was the big thing. They were like, can I eat this bloom? Can I eat this bloom? I was like, well, <laughs> you can give it a shot. <laughs> um, don't eat all of them. But um, that was probably the biggest question. They, um, there was a, a lot of interest in permaculture and just in edibles in general. But um, I don't know if anyone will go exactly into rain garden design. <laughs> Cool. So Polly says that she thinks that there's a USGS is doing a study on collected street sweeping material in Chittenden County and the results are supposed to be finalized soon and provided a link that I think everybody, oh wait, everybody can't see. Let me see if we can get it to everybody uh, this way. The link that's coming into the chat is the link to the, the results from Chittenden County uh, street sweeping material assessment. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. So somebody asks, is there educational signage by the garden? Um, yeah, great question. It was supposed to be there before COVID. Um, but, uh, and Stephanie, who asked the question earlier, she, um, uh, this was one of her grad students, um, Holly Greenleaf, uh, helped with, she is a landscape designer and also a graphic designer. Um, and so she helped with creating this sign. And it's, it's been, um, actually the zoning meeting is right after this uh, in Montpelier to get that final approval. Um, so it should be coming in just the next couple of weeks or months and unless the ground freezes very quickly and then it'll be next spring. But yes, coming, that is highly anticipated by all these people that walk past it and have a million questions, yeah. 
I will also put in a plug for something that we worked on with Paige and, and Sarah a little bit as well, which is a green infrastructure walking tour of Montpelier. And this is one of the featured sites on that walking tour. And I will put a link in the chat to the um, to the the map itself, but there's also available pages worked really hard to get those paper maps distributed. They're at VSCCU, they're at the Hunger Mountain Co-op and other places in Montpelier. So you can take a COVID safe tour with your household and see the, the rain garden. Yeah. Great. Um, we had one more question come in. This is a little a follow up that I was curious about. Um, Elena is asking, have you done any work with edible rain gardens? Um, since that was such a, an interesting point for the, for the VUICC folks. I have not. Here's kind of my take on it too, and I'm open to being persuaded otherwise. Um, with rain gardens, while um, the ones that I've worked on are relatively small in size, and I can see getting edibles on the outside, but you really don't want people compacting the materials and really being in the rain garden quite as much. Um, compaction can have a really serious impact on infiltration and just on plant roots in general. But um, yeah, I could see harvesting on the outside, but like any, any kind of question I get, it's always, it depends. It depends on the situation. It depends on what contaminants you've got coming in. It depends where the water's coming in from. It depends on uh, your sun. A lot of edibles need full sun, many. There are some that you don't need, but in general, I mean, if you've got blueberries and you know some of the edibles that people really want, I've found my clients, most of them are the full sun plants. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting, that's an interesting perspective. I, would, I tend to use um, natives a decent amount. So, um, you know, the, those ones, there is room for harvesting. Um, I tend to leave it more for wildlife. That's just my, that's just kind of my bias though. But uh, no, I haven't, so to answer, long story short, I have not designed any rain gardens to date that were one of the purposes was harvesting edibles. But maybe I will in the future. Thank you for the inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting question that you talk about with habitat. I remember taking a wetlands course long ago and constructed wetlands. Was our, our instructor was building constructed wetlands and he happened to be a duck hunter. And he, he says, well, I make them all so that they're good duck habitat. So that was his kind of preferential way of designing them. And, and it sounds like you have habitat for what, other kinds of species, not necessarily excluding ducks, but it's interesting to, to hear, like, you know, people bring their passions to their projects and... Yeah. Good point. Mm. Last chance for questions if anybody would like to ask something. We still have a lot of attendees, still more than 20 folks on the on the call with us. All right. Well, if not, it looks like if not, uh, as Sarah said, she's available via email. And thank you so much for taking time to share that story of this particular ring garden and your story about your career in this field. I think it's it's valuable for both reasons in terms of um, thinking about if other people are thinking about going into careers, our undergraduate students who are participating uh, and where they might head and, and, and then the science and the art of making these these things work uh, and also the hard work that's involved so appreciate your time and everybody for joining us we will get this uh, link out to you of the recording and then uh, next week we actually have um, Justin Geibel uh, from VYCC talking about workforce opportunities for youth and Mark Companion from uh, Lake Champlain Sea Grant talking about the maintenance and operations of these systems and opportunities, particularly around schools and getting involved in um, maybe doing this shop backing or something like that. So <laughs> thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everyone.